Hey, thanks so much for listening to the Ridge Community Church Podcast. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors on staff at the Ridge, and our vision is to bring the hope of Jesus into every home. So as a piece of that, our goal each week is to bring you something that's hopeful and helpful. So subscribe to this podcast to make sure you don't miss any hopeful and helpful conversations. Hey, everyone, and thanks for listening to this episode of the Ridge Podcast. If you find today's episode hopeful and helpful, then please follow or subscribe and then rate and review so that more people can find the conversation. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to give us a follow and turn on your notifications. Now today, I got to share with all of you the second part of a conversation that I had with a licensed professional marriage and family therapist, Amber Worth. In this half of the conversation, she's going to share some insights into how you can help your kid learn to handle pressure. This is part two of my conversation with Amber. One of the things I really wanted to to ask you about, because uh, I know a lot of parents are feeling this, because I think that uh, if there's one group of people, I think that maybe has, especially this this time, uh, I guess like 2024 faces so much of it is kids and students. And, uh, you know, in a lot of cases, they don't have uh, the skills yet. They haven't developed that capacity to deal with pressure. Uh, and so maybe we could spend a little bit of time, like for the parents, um, we'll start with there. Like if you want to, for those parents that want to help their kids deal with pressure, uh, and I would guess probably the, there's a few main ones. Um, but do you have any advice for parents? I think one of the biggest things that parents can do is learn how to model self-care and learn how to model what it means to love yourself in the midst of all of that pressure. Um, Because kids will see and respond to how you respond to stress. Um, They're very intuitive, you know? Um, And so I think that's one of the most part then, and modeling is a huge deal and more tons of parameters. So a lot of things I do is I'm like, okay, where do we model with taking breaks when needed? Um, where do we model self-care? You know, um, how do we model like what it means to kind of diffuse ourselves and be able to reset ourselves in the midst of a massive, you know, situation or event? I even say kind of like, okay, so I need you to notice where you're triggered and where you're hooked, where you might, you know, respond in a like an anger way or whatever towards your children. I want, I want them to learn to build those skills so that they are modeling that for their children. Mm. So like, you know what, you guys, I'm finding myself and I'm feeling very frustrated. I'll be like, kind of like 101. I'll be like, name how you're feeling for them so that they're able to understand and strive to figure out what their feelings are too. And then, you know, like, I'm really going to take some big deep breaths right now, you guys, you know, like, will you help me do that? Let's do it together. You know, it's very simple sort of practical things and an everyday thing that can model so- those sort of things to build those skills for the kids. Mm-hmm. When to identify when I need a break, how to respond appropriately when we do need a break, um, how to repair that work, you know, like, hey, I'm really sorry. I really am stressed out. It doesn't give me a reason to respond that way, but I'm really sorry. How do I repair this? Mm-hmm. So modeling that like, genuine authentic sort of um emotional um stuff that's going on um and through that i think modeling like modeling normalizing stress Mm. you know we're human we're fragile like we can't do everything perfect Mm. it's not reality so honey of course you're going to be really anxious right now of course you're going to feel really nervous for this event you know, you're human. How can I sort of like come around you in that? Not trying to fix fix those feelings, but be next to them, be with them on their journey of experiencing that the feelings in the pressure. You know, like again, normalizing. You should be anxious for a math test, but like this is a big deal. You know, and mm-hmm. here, like, so kind of normalizing that. Um, sounds like it sounds like with that um part of the thing is to acknowledge uh is to not necessarily strive to holistically remove 
all pressures and stress from them, um, which I think would be impossible. Uh, but instead, give them the tools and the strength to work through it. Does that sound? Yeah. 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 yeah so like, um, oh, you're fine. You know, like you'll be fine. Like just like trying to fix that, you know, in a way rather than, um, or, you know, kind of dim- not like defeat, like minimizing. Like, yeah, but like not trying to fix it, like going in of like, oh, be positive about this. You know what I mean? Like, okay, go in with a great attitude. Like, let's yeah, stop being yeah, that yeah. kind of thing. But uh, yeah, but like you're, you're, you're going to feel anxious. I'm with you there. I get it. Yeah. It's almost like you're giving them permission to feel um, and then saying, okay, how, how do we work through how you feel? Instead of saying like, not that you'd say these, this phrase, but essentially mm-hmm. the meaning of this phrase of, oh, just don't feel that way. It's, you don't need to. Great. <laughs> we don't love when people tell us that, right? So. Yeah. Because yeah. then that makes it feel like shame. Like, wow, I'm responding different than I should. Mm. Right. You know, it's kind of like I, sh- I should be feeling different, but I'm feeling anxious. There must be something wrong with me then, you know, mm, and that just builds that pressure. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, one thing, too, is that sort of comparison piece we're talking about is like this sort of like um, worry when parents come in, they're like, I in front of their kids it's like they're not doing like as best as the other kids, let's just say in their essays or in their math or whatever like they're not at the level that they should be at and I'm really honing in on like we are not comparing like Mm. um each kiddo in their process and progress is entirely different from the other um the comparative piece the kids will shut down you know they're gonna be like wow I suck you know Mm. and so I say we're not having conversations around that yeah. The comparative piece, because that really does induce a lot of shame of not feeling good enough. And um, really at a young age, that's such a fragile thing, you know? And so I'm like, I desire to uphold the gifts and talents and abilities that they have. And I want to strive to reinforce those Yeah, for the ways that maybe they need extra care. Everybody needs extra care in something. It doesn't yeah. matter what it is and it's okay. Yeah. Progress looks different for each kiddo. And yeah. so that's what we need to uphold. Yeah. And I think you, I mean, that touches on something I think that's super important. And uh, I think I want to preface it by saying parenting super hard and challenging. And um, every parent is doing their absolute, I love to believe every parent's doing their absolute best. They love their children and they want what's best for them. Uh, and it's easy to add pressure to... Yeah um, their kids and students in the best, best meaning way. Um, and, uh, is there anything you, yeah, I'm sure you have clients where you sense, okay, part of the situation is that there's a pressure being added by parents. Um, Mm -hmm. and like you mentioned, uh, you mentioned about this concept of there's a healthy pressure uh, which is that motivating piece, but then there's that excessive pressure. Is there a way to know when you've crossed that line into kind of creating excessive pressure? I think it's like honing in on what, what is the fear behind, um, maybe that comparison piece? What are we afraid of? Mm. And I'll just have them name it. You know, yeah. you love your child so much. And what is the fear behind this excessive pressure? Are you nervous that they're not going to perform in math. And that means that down the line, they're not going to be like um, able to function in society. You know, are they going to be bullied? Are they going to, you know, it's like a lot of things that I really desire for them to name themselves. So mm. the separate that is, again, of what is about your child and what is it about you? Mm. And so sometimes they do project that on their children when the anxiety piece is really about their anxiety um, and the stress that they have and the worry about their pressure that as a parent, that they're not doing something good enough with for their child. Mm. Wow. I mean, that talk about a, a, 
an exercise right there. The ability to like to name your fear uh, for your, I mean, everybody's got them, right? And particularly mm-hmm. name your fear for your kids. And I think that's really powerful because it sounds like that's a tool to where then you're able to identify, okay, how is what actions and behaviors am I doing out of fear of this thing rather than, um, I think we'd all love to act out of love rather than fear, right? Yeah. yeah. And the intentions are well, you know, that's the thing too. Yeah, it's like, of course. You know, um, the reason why they're scared is because they really worry about their children for sure. My gosh, the pressures that they do have every day and just so many things um, that children have to deal with nowadays is just extraordinarily hard. And so, again, honing in on like how the parents to like to to figure out how to connect and reconnect with themselves for that compassion for themselves. So they can model that for their children is really powerful. Um, one of the biggest things too, is, you know, like we were saying, like connecting with your child in the midst of their anxiety or pain, again, trying not to fix it, but striving to understand Mm. is like a huge key. Yeah. Yeah. Is there, uh, and not in a manipulative way, but is there any language that you'd recommend? Uh, I know sometimes it's helpful uh, to have phrases or things like that, that you can kind of go to and you're trying to like communicate that you want to understand well. Um, Maybe not, but I'm just curious if there's any that uh, you found helpful for clients. Well, I feel like I'm always gathering pieces, like a puzzle pieces to figure out where the symptoms are from the child. You know, yeah. sometimes so much pressure, you can see that the symptoms are coming out sideways. Yeah. Um, and that can look like, um, you know, high behaviors, high anxiety, you know, nightmares, um, just very like attachment issues. You know, there's a lot of things that I'm striving to understand and hone in on where the symptoms are coming out sideways. Um, and so gathering that information, gathering, what have they experienced lately? You know, was there any events that maybe triggered this? Was there any transition that the family went through that is maybe possibly inducing a lot of these symptoms? Um, and so it's a lot of gaining all these pieces to help figure out in the moment too, like, yeah, he had a behavior today. I was like, okay, well, let's kind of come around and use that experience for like, was there anything that induced that? Is there anything that, you know, you guys did to sort of help prevent that, you know? So it's a lot of really gaining an understanding in a way that kids just necessarily don't know how to name it. So I'm figuring all this out in the context, yeah. you know? Yeah. I think, wow, that, that sounds super helpful to like, I, I love that you say like they don't, know how to name it where it's like mm-hmm. if they could tell you exactly what was going wrong and the pressure they're facing that would be wonderful but that's part of the process right is like having that conver- having those conversations and um, walking through those challenging emotions that they're facing uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm curious um, one of the other I think really big pressure that kids and students are facing really is that like and I think part of it is is technology, and I love technology. So this isn't a down with down with down with the internet type of thing, mm-hmm. uh, but I do think that there is this great pressure of you know friends and uh, the pressure of feeling like they want to belong and the pressure of just like that peer pressure essentially. Um, mm-hmm. When you have someone that's really struggling with. Uh, the pressure of fitting in or, or that kind of zone of like really that uh, their friendships and things like that. Um, is there a different way that you had try to help them talk through that or are there, or, or are the tactics kind of similar? Again, it's like contextual for the kiddo. And like, I feel like what you're sort of like kind of holding in is like a lot of like um, middle school, high school kids are dealing with that yeah. piece. Um and, it, and it's hard because like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, 39. So I don't really know what it is like to be a child in our society now with that technology. And, um, what I do know is interestingly that a lot of these kiddos are really lonely. 
Mm. And um, lonely is, I think, the scariest feeling for kids to feel. Yeah. Because when they start to feel lonely, then they start to feel alienated and then they start to feel like a failure. And then that shame response sort of hits in. And that's when the depression comes and mm-hmm. um, the anxiety. And so, again, it's like it's so so hard for me because I do desire even as a therapist to like fix that. You know, like I really I don't I don't want them to feel lonely. And yet at the end of the day, it is kind of a powerful thing just to feel like like to name that like you're lonely or you. You know, like, let's talk about what that means. Does that mean that you're a failure or a bad friend? No. Does that mean that you're socially awkward? No. You know, so there's so many things that kind of hone in on that. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I don't really necessarily know how technology sort of plays a role in that other than like, I think they go on it to make them feel not lonely. And I think that it doesn't really help. Yeah. And not like this genuine connection of authentic connecting. Yeah. Um, so I'm trying to kind of figure out how these kiddos can connect with themselves mm. instead of connecting to the, the social media and Snapchat and all this stuff. Like, how do we reconnect with ourselves? Mm. Is there anything that helps that? Um, sometimes it really is just like figuring out again, like cognitive behavioral stuff. Um, really being with family members and helping my parents um, come around them in a way that's like, Hey, don't feel lonely. We're here. We love you. Rather than that, like sitting with them in the, in the midst of the loneliness. Mm. Yeah. Mm. You know, I'm, and even in the, I'm sensing a a pretty big theme, uh, which is that it's okay to feel it's okay to be in that emotion. And our gut response almost always is, I don't want to feel this, which I mean, who does, right? So that's fair. Uh, mm-hmm. And I want to fix it either for myself or I want to fix it for someone else. I want that them no longer to feel that way. And uh, maybe that type of response drives it to not be helped. And instead, it's usually a lot more about, okay, how do you get through this? How do you process through this? How do you experience this in a healthy way? So that, especially for kids and students, right? So that when they're mm-hmm. on their own and they face it again and you're not there, they'll have the tool set to overcome it rather than having it already been kind of pushed away. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, definitely. You know, again, it's kind of like sort of like typically parents who want to fix and fix and fix and don't really necessarily want to have to go to those uncomfortable spaces. It's mm. because of their own anxiety. Mm. Again, the thing is like um, this um, impacts me, but it's not about me. Um, so how do I sit in my stuff in the midst of sitting in the other people's stuff? Well, yeah. And then that just builds on the pressure. Right. Mm-hmm. Where it's like, then it's the pressure to, oh, well, I've got to be right in order to help them. And so I, I have my own pressure to get better. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's really powerful to be able to say, this isn't, uh, this isn't just me. Um, this isn't, um, your phrase, like this isn't about me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One thing too is like making, the things that I talk about is making the implicit explicit as much as we do. So like, um, again, in the, I think just living in the Midwest, we're very much, um, sweep things under the rug. Um, hard to talk about things that are in our mind to come out for, for that feeling of uncomfortableness and naming things. So, um, it's kind of like I say to my like my family is like I want you to say I'm com- I'm uncomfortable feeling um, in your anxiety I'm feeling really uncomfortable right now but how can I be helpful even if I don't know how to help I want to open that conversation up explicitly mm-hmm. so that opens some parameters of like even if you don't know how to respond back. I'm explicitly saying I'm feeling tension right now. I'm feeling anxious. Um, and I don't know what you need. Um, do you, 
how can I be helpful in this moment? So it's kind of like breaking those weird sort of communication barriers to kind of make it, even if it's kind of like awkward, but to make it explicit. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, I mean, that, that makes a lot of sense. I think, especially you mentioned, uh, kind of the, essentially the societal pressure not to do that, whether that's because of a feeling of like, oh, I'm adding to their burden or I should be able to process this in my, my own little brain and not have to say anything. But to, to talk about, talking about modeling that behavior, you're cre- essentially creating your own culture where it's okay to process through those emotions. Um, and I mean, isn't that, isn't that the type of culture we want? Right. Yeah. It, it takes vulnerability. And I think that's what the big fear is, you know, of um, being like, I don't know how, I don't know how to respond right now, but I, I'm going to try. Yeah. And that takes a lot of guts, you know? Yeah. Hmm. Any, uh, yeah. Any closing thoughts when it comes to anything you hope people walk away with or, uh, whether it's about, you know, helping kids and students, whether it's, you know, working on the own things you're facing. Uh, yeah. Mm. I think like the main general theme of, of dealing with it is, is having self-compassion on yourself. Mm. You know, we, we live in a really, really like hard world. And I think that the true sense of what I learned in my own personal therapy is how to have grace and, and self-compassion on myself. And what does that mean? Mm. You know, um, it's hard to do again. Like we, we're very, very hard. Ourselves. Yeah. And I think therapeutically and just that journey of giving yourself grace is a really powerful component for healing and dealing with general stress. Like, absolutely. I'm going to like feel really, really, really um, anxious today. I have a big meeting, you know, like, of course I'm going to feel depressed. You know, my um, grandma just passed or, you know, just those, of course I'm going to feel all these feelings I'm human and this is really really hard. So I give myself permission, you know, permission to just show up where I need to show up. Mm. That's so powerful. I love that. Amber, thank you so much. Thank you for, for sharing it and walking us through this thing that I think, um, sometimes we don't talk about as much as we should. And so thank you for the insights and the wisdom and, uh, thank you for your time. Thanks, John. I appreciate it. Well, that was part two of my conversation with Amber. And let me just send a huge thank you to Amber for all of her insights. I do want to add that if you are a follower of Jesus, I'd encourage you to remind your kids that their their value and their worth, it doesn't come from any sort of accomplishment or the approval of others. It comes from who Jesus says they are. And he says that they are loved, that they are valuable, and he showed that they were worth dying for. I found in my life that the more rooted I am in that principle, the better starting point I have for anything that I have to face. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Ridge Podcast. And make sure to follow and subscribe so that you don't miss any hopeful and helpful conversations. Hey, thanks so much for listening to the Ridge Community Church Podcast. My name is John. I'm one of the pastors on staff at the Ridge, and our vision is to bring the hope of Jesus into every home. So as a piece of that, our goal each week is to bring you something that's hopeful and helpful. So subscribe to this podcast to make sure you don't miss any hopeful and helpful conversations.